This is the 5 Minute Monday Motivator with me, Alistair McCall. Welcome to, to Champion Minded, the podcast Minded. for those who aim for excellence, not only in the sports arena, but in life. My name is Alistair McCall, author, speaker, mindset and performance coach. And my goal is to help you unleash your unlimited potential and provide you with the tools to achieve greatness. Are you ready to become Champion Minded? Then let's do this. Hey everybody, welcome to the Champion Minded Podcast, or welcome back to it. I'm Alistair McCall. In this episode of What It Takes, I'm talking to Vicki Williamson. Now for some of you out there who are not too familiar with the name of Vicki Williamson, she's an elite British bobsledder and former track cyclist who specialized in the sprint disciplines. In 2013, with Rebecca James, she won the bronze medal in the team sprint at the World Track Championships. She also had an uh, extremely successful junior career in 2011 at the Junior Track World Championships in Moscow. She won a silver in the 500 meter time trial, a bronze in the sprint, and came fifth in the Karen. She made her senior debut, uh, world debut very shortly after and won a bronze medal, as I mentioned, with uh, Becky James, Re- Rebecca James, in the team sprint at the 2013 World Track Championships in Minsk, Belarus. She is 26, but will be actually 20, turning 27 in a few days' time on the 15th of September. So let's make sure we wish her a happy birthday. Definitely one of the main reasons why I wanted to get Vicky onto the podcast it is because she is someone that's overcome adversity. She had an horrific accident back in uh, 2016 in Rotterdam. That was the uh, six days of Rotterdam, or as they say in Dutch, the zes dage, dagse van Rotterdam. Um, she was involved in a collision with, uh, with another rider and ended up with a broken neck and back, dislocating her pelvis and slipping a disc in her neck. It looked like obviously her career was done. And uh, this is just a fascinating story of courage, of willpower, of discipline, dedication. Obviously, she's been able to get herself back to um to a very very high level as i mentioned she's now elite blood bod sledder going for the uh, olympics in 2022 um and also as i said she was an elite track cyclist also something very very fascinating is that she wasn't even a cyclist to start off with she was actually in track and field and uh, was invited to do some tests with a, a cycling team they found out that she had the goods two years later she's in the world stage it's just a fascinating story guys because you know me um, I'm all about performance. I've studied so many athletes and, and environments around the world. And when I came across Vicky on Twitter, I just thought to myself, I have to get her on the podcast. Such a fascinating story. Like I said, uh, someone that's uh, been an elite in two sports, <laughs> track cycling and bobsled, which is, which is amazing. Um, you'll hear from this podcast just how dedicated she is, how disciplined she is, a little bit of a bit about her background, how she was brought up as well, her relationship with her parents, um, and and so much more. Again, you know, fascinating. Here's somebody that broke their back and their neck and their back at the top level. You know, speaking to Vicky in this podcast, she reminded me of one of my favorite quotes. It's by Booker T. Washington. It goes like this. Success is to be measured not so much by the position that one has reached in life as by the obstacles which they have overcome. Guys, she's champion minded. This is Vicky Williamson. Enjoy. Vicky, welcome to the Champion Minded Podcast. Hi, how are you? <laughs> I'm good, thanks. I think uh, you've had an eventful day already, right? Yes, I have. So I'm in the middle of a house move and um, I just went over to the neighbor's house basically to use his Wi Fi and the alarm <laughs> went off and I didn't know his code. So. The police could pitch up at any point. <laughs> Hopefully not, though. All right. Okay. So if we hear something going on in the background, we know um, we know you're in trouble. So <laughs> yeah, if I get dragged away, that might be why. <laughs> um, first off, how have things been in the last few months with uh, with the COVID and your training and everything? How's that gone for you? Um, it's actually not been too bad, to be fair. Um, obviously, it could have been better, but equally, it could have been a lot worse. Um, a company actually sent me out some weights um, on loan at kind of week, I guess, week four or five in lockdown. So I actually only had a few weeks with no weights. So that was actually, a, you know, quite a positive. Um, managed to find a relatively flat field as well, just down the road, because obviously um, athletics tracks and stuff were closed. Mm-hmm. So 
no, it, it, it was it was hard work, but um, at the same time, I was one of the fortunate um, athletes to have access to sort of, yeah, well, weight so I could get my strength training done. So I was, yeah, I was very lucky. Mm, yeah, it's been a challenging time for, for many athletes. So um, still is. Are the, are the gyms open there in, in the UK yet? Um, yeah, they are. So gyms opened, oh, God, about four or five weeks ago, maybe. Um, but basically, they're just kind of you know still using social distance measures and at the crossfit gym which i train at you have to book mm -hmm. an open gym slot so it's just a case of you know being organized and working out you know when you want to train and stuff and, and making sure that gets booked but all the equipment's free to use it's just you have to wipe everything down i guess yeah, yeah. so yeah yeah everything's back to normal nearly so everything's back to normal but it's not <laughs> yeah well the well, new norm the new normal the clean the clean yeah. normal the ocd normal <laughs> exactly yeah exactly so anyway vicky let's go back in in time to where and when it all started for you in uh, in sports um so i started athletics i would say kind of at the the county club um city of norwich athletics club at maybe 12, 13 years old. Um, and at that point, I kind of started doing sprint hurdles. So this was, I guess, where my sporting sort of passion first first developed. Um, I mean, even in primary school and stuff, I was always super competitive on sports day and um, was, you know, a clear 10, 15 metres ahead of everyone else. Um, so, yeah, I could finally join the athletics club at 13. And then that was where I guess I fell in love with with hurdles really and that was the my first kind of taste of of sport um I traveled around with the team kind of doing leagues and stuff over the summers um I ended up with two English schools medals and a national indoor medal um so yeah I was I was quite good at the time for my age um and yeah, I just in high school, I did lots of sports, as I'm sure a lot of now professional sports people would agree. I think everyone starts off kind of doing a little bit of everything. Um, so I had the athletics on sort of in the background, but then I also did some county level netball. And then I actually trialed out for the lacrosse team. Um, okay. I know that's quite big in the States, isn't it? Yeah, in some some universities, yeah, um, it um, is. So yeah, basically, um, I I fell in love with um lacrosse, which we played um at my high school, um, and actually got onto the England team for lacrosse, um, which oh, was wow. quite interesting. Um, but then obviously, then came the big transfer to cycling, and basically, I got picked up by a talent ID program. Someone from my athletics club basically saw online that they were looking for powerful female athletes, which is which is actually pretty rare in the UK. I think I, I would quite confidently say that a lot of, lot more women, especially back then, I think the trend is changing now, but I think a lot more women did more endurance mm -hmm. um, sports as, a, as opposed to the, the, high, the high power and explosive, explosive sports. Um, so yeah, basically went down to, or up to Manchester to get tested um, back okay, in 2009. So, so before we go there, I want to go back and... First of all, so did you only start sports at 12, 13 or had you already started like before that? Because that, um, I because, guess that, because that's pretty late for, for, you know, obviously a professional athlete to, to, to start sports. You know, usually you hear it's like seven, eight. Um, did you do a few things before then? Um, I guess before, I think 11 or 12, or I think 12 might have been the age that you were allowed to join the athletics club. I think you had to be... Okay. There was sort of a, you had to be 12 or 13. But I mean, before that, I actually forgot to mention, I, I played golf. Um, oh, okay. So my, <laughs> so yeah, my, my family's um full of golfers. So my sister's actually on a scholarship at Florida State University for oh. golf at the minute. Well, she's close um, to me then, so. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, she's um she's pretty good at golf. But my, my, her, my whole family... um played my mum played for England so did my dad um so okay. I guess that was kind of my natural route into sport was through golf but um I quickly found out that it was not really the sport for me my patience and <laughs> did, did, did not go well, did not go down well <laughs> well to be honest with you there's a massive difference between golf and and track cycling I mean they're, they're I think they're on the opposite <laughs> opposite of the spectrum to be honest 
um so yeah that was um I I kind of it was clear that I that I wanted to run really I think even in primary school I loved sports day and I just loved speed stuff and and you know quick sports so again when so when I joined the athletics club that was I had sort of run and stuff before and had played golf um I actually did a bit of taekwondo as well believe it or not it's another thing in there um and then yeah just um yeah just concentrated on athletics from then on out okay so you're from a sporty family um lots of sports going on golf taekwondo track and field um and then you got into cycling when you were 16 17 is that correct yeah yeah six, 16 yeah okay so how did that come about um so the one of the coaches at the athletics club um he knew someone at British Cycling, um, Ian Dyer, and basically they had a talent ID program on, which was a, which was actually set for 18 to 25 year olds. It was called the Girls for Gold program. Again, looking for powerful girls in in different sports and trying to, I guess, follow on Victoria Pendleton's mm-hmm. legacy in in track cycling. Okay, but hold um, on, had had you ever ridden a bike before? I mean, you know um, how to no. ride a bike, but have you done some races or you done some like you know no li- literally nothing no no all, all um okay. all I knew was that I was strong and powerful just from the fact that my my quads and and legs in general were muscular <laughs> <laughs> um so I think that was just kind of the you know let's let's get her up there and see if she's see if she's powerful um kind of thing so then I went up for testing obviously I was kind of outside the age bracket if you like because it was obviously set for older girls at the time but um I actually blew a lot of them away um and I was only 16 so that obviously Hmm. showed to British Cycling that I had had some talent um and then basically I made it through the whole process and was the only um female athlete out of I think 3,000 applicants who basically then gained a place on the GB team as as the outcome so okay so I mean track cycling is pretty daunting I mean it's it's a it's a dangerous sport it's obviously the I don't think people realize how um how steep that that curve is at a velodrome I mean it is you know you only realize it when you go there and you see it it's like okay wow this is like almost like a wall on tv it doesn't look the same so (laughs) how was that for you getting used to getting used to that um, yeah, it was that was um, yeah quite difficult, and it did take some time because, like you say, on on television, it looks flat, and it, even the steepest tracks in the world, you can you know even later on in my career towards the end, I'd still be you know a bit twitchy riding around the top, and then when you watch it back on on the TV or the you know on on video feedback, it, it doesn't make sense. It looks flat. Yeah. Um, so yeah, just I think again. I had really good coaches behind me um, at the time when I first got on the program was um, Jan van Eyden, who had come over from the German team. Um, he was world champion. He was very skilled. Um, John Norfolk was my other coach and Ian Dyer was another coach. And mm-hmm. they were just really, you know, helpful and supportive. And just it, it was all about building confidence, really, um, to get to the top of the track and and be and be comfortable. And it's something that you take for granted when you've ridden for years but I think when you see novices hop on and realize that they actually can't get to the fence <laughs> um it's you realize then just how steep it is and and then I think you you appreciate then kind of the skill and I guess the la- the lack of fear that it took to get up there yeah that's incredible I mean that's pretty late so 17 years old now um I mean, things came pretty quick to you because you went to the Junior World Championships, right? Was that like that, that first year you started or was that like... Um, I think it was the second year. So I started in kind of 2009, 2000 or kind of start, yeah, around that time. So then I'd say I'd been riding for maybe about a year, just over a year. And then I, yeah, and then I had the the Junior World Championships and European Championships. <laughs> oh, talk about talk about jumping a few uh, a few levels, okay? Pretty, pretty, <laughs> yeah. pretty quickly. Yeah. Um, yeah. How was that experience for you? I mean, was I mean, obviously you'd had to do a few qualifying races. You had to race a few international races first of all. So, um, 
how was that experience for you? I mean, it, it, it seems like, like this all came very fast for you. Um, yeah, no, it, it definitely did. And like I said before, I knew it. I was kind of, I guess, higher than I'd ever been in athletics. I mean, I'd, I'd kind of represented my country at English schools, but I'd never never had a GB vest as such. Um, but no, I, I remember it. The, um, the World Championships was in, my first one was in Monte Chiari in Italy. And I just remember being just, you know, fearless and just young and, and aggressive and just wanted to get out there and and absolutely smash it to pieces basically <laughs> um so no it was you know it was a really good um experience and stuff and I think uh, well I think I can speak for a lot of athletes when it's kind of your your first debut and you're young and stuff and you know there's none of this kind of I guess, pressure to perform and, you know, pressure within yourself, external pressure of sponsor, sponsors and things like that. You're so kind of, you felt you've no, just got the raw... So you, sorry, felt no, raw. you felt no pressure going into into these competitions? Um, no, no. I, felt, I, I, was, I remember I was just kind of at this stage, I was just carefree and just had, you know, I effectively had nothing to lose. All, uh -huh. I, all I could do was just give absolutely everything and just see where I ended up. I think because I'd not grown up in track cycling um again I, maybe that was why I didn't have this sense of kind of pressure and you mm -hmm. know oh, I, I need to win or I need to get a medal or, or anything like that I was just kind of uh a bit rough around the edges but had um quite a lot of watts if you like so <laughs> mm. interesting very interesting um let's talk about coaches and mentors uh, how um have you had coaches that definitely like made a difference in in your life um you know this is a question i usually ask uh when i speak and when i you know when i do workshops etc is like i always ask people how many coaches did you have and then they think of a number and then how many really made a difference so for you who's made a difference in your life uh, be it from coaches or or mentors um I'd, I'd say my athletics um coaches i guess from the from the very beginning, um, they they if you like had an imprint on my on my life. Um, Keith Yollop and Mike Utting, they're just two local coaches from Norwich, and they I guess kind of helped to nurture m my initial talent and my initial drive, and kind of direct me um, down a down the path that then I guess led me onto cycling. Um, and then I guess throughout throughout my cycling career um I worked with Jan van Eyden for the whole the whole journey um John Norfolk was the guy who I would say had had again the initial initial impact if you like because he was the one who kind of got me through the talent ID kind of got me up on a bike helped me learn how to ride the rollers and then I got passed on to Jan and Ian Dyer who's now actually head coach he's he's kind of been moved up the chain so I think I have although it's it's hard to pinpoint one kind of in those initial uh -huh. stages i think it i have been lucky to have a really good sort of support network ar around me if um if that makes sense um and each one has had a different impact and as i guess you know they're all very different in their coaching styles as well i'd say ian is kind of I guess more sort of facts and figures and you know it, it is what it is kind of thing. is the numbers and let's you know let's work out you know why you've done this and why you haven't reached this um yeah and I was more of a, a race coach and I guess came across softer if you like more kind of a softer personality mm -hmm. I mean not not by no means a pushover but um I guess came across slightly more empathetic so mm -hmm. I think they work together well as a team because they kind of bounced off each other and you kind of got the best of both worlds. Mm. So dur during this, yeah, no, during this time, where were your parents? Did you have, do you have parents that were pushy or they were just saying, you know, you know, that's your journey, go ahead. So where was, where was the balance there with, with your parents, for example? Um, I was actually really fortunate that um, that my parents weren't pushy at all because I mean I see it now a lot in sport where you see mm -hmm. obviously parents like to get behind their um, their children and stuff and I get that and I and I would probably or well you know when I have children I, I I would be the same but there is a fine line between 
pushy and just kind of letting you know letting your children get on with it um mm-hmm. I think it did help that I guess my parents knew absolutely nothing about track cycling um <laughs> so they'd kind of come and watch training and watch like national championships and could, because it was so new to them as well they were just trying to take it all in mm-hmm. as well um but I think even from a young age I've I've kind of never needed that push I'd always kind of be up and out the door or you know waiting in the car for my parents to take me to the track and stuff that I guess I I never really needed that that push if that makes sense mm. so this is fascinating because you didn't choose cycling in a way cycling chose you right yeah yeah no no I would agree definitely so did you fall in love with the sport what what was it that attracted you to cycling because it's almost like, you know, just like you said there now, you were picked because of your, your explosiveness, your fast twitch fiber muscles, all these things into another sport. So was it like um, first love, like, hey, I really like this or, hey, I'm good at this. I'm going to see where it goes. Um, I, I think definitely to, to begin with, it was more of a case of I'm, I'm pretty good at this. So I'll just kind of see where it goes. Um Again, there were there were aspects that I wasn't sure about, kind of you know riding around the top at the you know at the time and and things like that. But I think again, I'm I'm very much I was so driven by the fact that the coaches were impressed and said you you know you could you could be really good at this. I think that was what made me sort of fall in love with it. It wasn't a case of I love riding a bike. Let's join the, or let's try and get on the GB cycling team. It was a, it was, yeah, like you say, the other way around. I've got some talent here. Let's see how far we can take it kind of thing. Mm. All right. So let's go to 2016. That's obviously a, um, a significant year in your life. You had a horrific crash at a pro race in Rotterdam. And I'm going to use my Dutch here at the Ses Dage, Dagse. Uh, which is the six-day race in Rotterdam. I used to live in, in the Netherlands, so obviously um, track cycling oh, nice. was massive there, and, and uh, yeah. especially that race as well. It's just like six days. Of oh, just, it's huge. Yeah, it's yeah, just one yeah. big party, yeah. isn't it? It's just like um, everybody comes there and, and enjoys the, um, the six days of Rotterdam. So, But um, that is where something obviously happened to you. You had a horrific accident. You broke your neck and your back. Um, and my pelvis as well (laughs) good gracious so talk to us about that I mean um so Mm -hmm. yeah so basically um I was um supposed to be going to Hong Kong World Cup at the time but basically had had kind of passed on that and had gone out to the sixth day um as a as a friendly just to get some race experience um my form was the best it's ever been. I was literally on the form of my life. Um, and then came up against Ellis Lickley from the Netherlands in the final. And unfortunately, we collided as I was going to overtake her out of the last bend. And she kind of lost control and, you know, got, I guess, entangled with me. And then we basically both drove right up to the fence, um, crashed into the fence and then and then that was kind of yeah that was that was the end basically <laughs> what do you remember from that do you do you remember when you were lying on the track do you remember you know certain things were you th- thinking anything what explain to us that that moment or the um, moments so, after that you know i guess i was um i was really lucky that i didn't remember anything i guess lucky would would be the um you know lucky in both aspects that i'm kind of here today and lucky that i don't remember anything um so the last thing I remembered was holding on to the barrier in the middle, kind of just before we rolled up and basically some, a, a German guy was, you know, oh, do you want some beer? Do you want some beer? I was like, no, no, <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. Thanks. I'm about to, about to race kind of thing. So that was the last thing I remember. And then after that, it was kind of my eyes opening, a, sort of opening and closing as I was getting wheeled into hospital and actually at the time I, I don't know what painkillers and stuff I was on but I don't think that nobody knew the extent to my injuries as well and I remember asking the girl who was with me to take a picture of me because I, I for some reason I was finding it funny at the time I said oh just take a picture of me <laughs> so I've got a picture of kind of uh, on my phone of I guess like blood all around my head and I've got a thumbs up and obviously at this stage I think 
they thought I'd only broken um, a few ribs. And then it was obviously quite evident as the as the time went on that it was actually um, quite serious. So, Wow. Um, okay, so you get the diagnosis. Doctors tell you that you've broken your neck, your back, your pelvis. You're lying in hospital. What are you thinking? Um, so the first few days I was... I was not really with it. I was just, you know, passed out. Basically, I was high on fentanyl, which is 10 times stronger than morphine. Um, so it's it's pretty strong. Um, but I think when it hit home, I guess, as to the extent of the injuries was when the British cycling team doctor flew out on, I guess, I think it was about day 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 two or three, maybe. And basically, he said to me, you know, I, I, we're going to have to, you know, I want to address this now. Rio, um, the Rio Olympics is not going to happen. Um, and, you know, I remember thinking at the time, obviously, I was devastated. I remember in, was in the hospital room with my mum and my partner at the time. And we were just I just remember just being absolutely devastated and just almost in, in disbelief. And I remember thinking, oh, the Games is six months away it's fine, you know, I, I can get back, I can get back. And I, I kind of, again, I don't think I realised how bad the injuries were at this point. I was kind of, yeah, I was in denial that I was going to make it to the Olympic Games in mm -hmm. six months. But um, I guess that's the attitude that I've that I've always had. And it was, you know, it, it was just that, unfortunately, th this time that I, I was wrong and, I, you know, I wasn't going to make the Games. So obviously, I mean, with with what happened, um, was there doubt in your mind that you'd ever return to cycling? Or were you just with that determined attitude and mindset that, you know, I'm going to get back to this no matter what? Um, I mean, there were times when it was tough. Don't, don't get me wrong, um, especially in the initial stages. And even during rehab, you know, when I was kind of trying to rebuild my body, but never did I doubt that I would that I would get back uh, like I knew that you know it, it was going to take time and I think I didn't realize how long that it was going to take it was only I guess once I you know fully started my rehab and and things that I realized oh this is going to be long haul um but no it was it was never a question of you know am I going to make it back it was always just when for me <laughs> although that sounds crazy but <laughs> How was the how was the period of the the rehabilitation and getting back to obviously the level that you're at? How was that period for you? Um, that was the that was super hard. So initially, I was kind of laying. I laid flat in hospital for you know four four and a half weeks, um, and then it was kind of a case of getting up and learning to walk again. Um, and then it was you know once I was out and at home, it was a case of I was only allowed to you know not use the frame for maybe maybe half an hour a day um and then I kind of started aqua um aqua therapy or hydrotherapy sorry I'm um, at the hospital and the actual initial stage of I guess getting used to my new body and my new pelvis was was quite hard um that I wasn't actually allowed to exercise for I think it was just over a year because I had so much bone graft put in put into my um, back and pelvis that it basically had to heal. So for the first just over a year, I, I couldn't really do any exercise other than walking. So obviously that was super frustrating for me and um, it was something that I just had to get used to. Um, and then I began my, I guess, rehab journey from normal person back to elite athlete. I began that in... May 2017 and then joined the team up at British Cycling back in January 2018 so I had a good nine ten months at the intensive rehab unit in London which was a Monday to Friday centre um they only had three athletes in per week um sometimes they'd only have two or I think on a couple of occasions it was only me so there's I guess a team of eight to ten people working solely on on those three athletes who have basically had really bad injuries and it's a center that's basically designed to fast paced or you know get people mm -hmm. back to their national governing bodies as quickly as possible um and still to this day I solely hold everyone in that team responsible for 
for where I am today, really. Oh. Okay, so let's move forward. 2019, you make a shift to bobsleigh. Now, I mean, I, yeah. I, I find mm -hmm. this fascinating. So was it that um, you'd had enough of cycling and you wanted a new challenge, or was it maybe the, you wanted to go to the, the Winter Olympics? So tell us how that came about. How, how did you get into bobsleigh and why? Um, so basically, we obviously at this stage, Tokyo hadn't been delayed a year. Tokyo was obviously supposed to be, you know, 2020. Um, and I think I was getting to the stage where I, my back was just not in a good way at all. Um, I had a, a race in September um, and in last September, so t mm -hmm. 2019. And basically that was kind of my last chance to, I guess, lay down some more qualification points for Tokyo. Um, three weeks out um, from that race, I had spinal injections because my back had just completely given way we'd been on a training camp and it was just a mixture of, of everything kind of being bent over in that aggressive position that we have to ride on you know on the velodrome and and heavy weights and it just had enough so so naturally I you know still went to the Poland Grand Prix with the with the hope to perform but I'd effectively sat on my backside for 10 days prior to that having had three or four injections so um I was just proud of myself really for getting up and you know still still giving it a go but obviously I wasn't where I needed to be um so then it was a case of coming back and sitting down with the coaches and you know I think given the time frame and what was required and kind of the state that my body was in I think it was just a decision that needed to be made and I think you know I've I'd spent a long time getting back to I guess being able to ride the velodrome and then just over a year of mm -hmm. kind of competing and, and riding and stuff and you know it was in the back of my mind it was a bit like you know I felt like I've not been quite good enough for you know a few years now that it was just you know I wanted to try something new so basically I was really lucky that um I stumbled across the fact that the GB bobsleigh driver um, Misha McNeil was looking for brake women and I remember seeing the kind of the the talent ID stuff that she tweeted about back in July um, just that she was looking for strong powerful brake women and I thought oh okay you know, so explain I, to I, us I, what a explain to us what a brake woman is <laughs> um, so basically for the women there's two people in the bobsleigh so there's the driver and then you have the brake woman who are basically is responsible for I guess half of the the push off the block, um, mm -hmm. and it's basically just a a six second flat out um, sprint pushing a hundred and eighty kilo sled, and then it's a case of once you're in, you know, trying to stay as still as possible, bent over in the back um, of the sled, and then you know you're kind of you, your your life is in the driver's hands then, and then when <laughs> you get to the end, it's um. It's a case of just waiting for the call off the driver and and doing as the as the job title says, pulling on the brakes as the brake woman. So, <laughs> so I mean, by the sounds of it, there's definitely a need for speed for you, Vicky. Yes, there is. <laughs> there I mean, yeah, you're just definitely. going from one explosive sport, which is obviously very dangerous, to probably one that's even more dangerous, to be honest. Even more dangerous, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, what is it? What is it that gives you the, 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 the thrill? Is it, is, it the, is it the speed? Is it the, the danger? What is it that really excites you about, you know, doing sports that are pretty dangerous? <laughs> um, I, I, I think it's the adrenaline it's, mm -hmm. and it's the, the, it's the rush, you, you know, you get from the speed and it's the... I guess the endorphins from, you know, doing a, a max out effort. Again, I, you know, I've always liked, you know, max lifts in the gym, heavy lifts in the gym um, mm -hmm. and, and that kind of thing. It's just, it's a mixture of, yeah, the adrenaline and just how it makes me feel, you know, you're giving absolutely everything to, to every rep. And that's very much how, how I, you know, how I like to, I guess, live, live my life really. So it's fair to say your next sport is going to be Formula One, right? <laughs> I, I wish I could. Yeah, I don't think my neck could handle it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the G-force. Actually, I had um, I had a Formula One driver on the podcast, Enrique Binaldi. He used to race for um, 
Minardi Formula One. And he was explaining to me, obviously, the G-force that, that happens in a, a Formula One car. It's, I mean, those guys have to be fit. Those guys and, and yeah, girls. Yeah, super there's, fit. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, what they put their body through, everybody just thinks it's just sitting in a car. Um, oh, and, no, I can. I already know it is. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And also what you do there as well, bobsleigh, like, you know, 99% of us wouldn't understand what you put your body through and, and, and obviously the the amount of force there on the body and keeping your balance and so on and so forth. So, um, so we've right. got G's actually, I was going to, I was going to say some, some tracks are kind of four, four to five G's in the corners. And obviously instead of being, the driver's got to handle that G force, I guess, sat upright into the corners. Whereas I've got to handle that G force with my head literally between my knees. So it's literally like someone's putting a weight onto your back. Mm. um so i guess it's yeah just sim, sim well i don't think it's as much as formula one but um if you mix that with kind of getting thrown around uh you know an ice track it's you feel like you've come out of a tumble dryer at the end trust me <laughs> <laughs> so <clears throat> so um in the uk are there actual bobsleigh um courses or i don't know what you call them what do you call them tracks courses um tracks, uh, tracks no okay. there is there isn't any um full-on tracks we've obviously you know, there's the funding isn't great um, for winter sports in the in the mm -hmm. UK, but there is a a push track which is um, located at Bath University, which bobsleigh and skeleton and luge can use in the UK. So that's literally just an athletics mm -hmm. track, I guess. That they've they've kind of built in a massive hill, like a sort of roller coaster system, if you like. So everyone can practice their you know their starts with the bobsleighs they're kind of put into the put into the runners and then you push down the hill jump in and then it slows down with the system at the top and then you you get flown back up so that that's kind of as close to um bobsleigh as we get in in this country so um the, the facilities aren't great but but we're still we're not bad considering the resources that we have. Yeah, who, so that's a good question. Who are the powerhouse countries in, in bobsleigh? Who, who are the dominant ones? Um, I would say the the Germans are kind of very much the, I guess the, I don't know what, what you would call it, the the kings and queens of, yeah, <laughs> of, the front of runners, bobsleigh. Yeah. They, yeah, yeah, they kind of, um, I guess, I mean, obviously I've only done a season, but I noticed that they were kind of consistently cleaning up at the World Cups, um, World Championships. Um, the American girls, there's um, Kaylee Humphreys. Um, she's pretty good as well. She actually won the Women's World Champs. So I think between, yeah, the Germans and the um, the, the female Americans anyway, the men's um is a bit more of an open ball game, but the, the women are very good from America. Okay, so explain to me what makes a good bobslayer. Um, it's a, a mixture between, or a hybrid, I should say, or, of a weightlifter and a sprinter is basically the ideal combination. <laughs> so it's all, all power, um, all power and explosiveness. Yes, basically, yeah. So it's, um, it's, yeah, you do need to be super strong, but also you need to be, super quick as well and um another thing that's kind of prominent in bobsleigh is the weight um so we basically have to make a minimum weight and that means that the the, the athletes especially in the women's the, the two girls do have to be quite heavy so obviously it's finding that balance between that weight being on your body or strapped into the sled mm -hmm. so ideally obviously we would be as heavy as possible but obviously we still need to be able to move because if we're heavier then we push a lighter sled kind of thing okay um competition so i mean how often are you competing is it is it, you know a few world cup races per year or what, what's your competition schedule like um so the pre-season begins in kind of sort of mid to end of october and then the world cups kick off from november through till February um there's quite a few world cups though um I think there was eight last season eight, eight to ten so I guess they have that once the season kind of kicks kicks off they're kind of every week or every two weeks mm -hmm. so um, it's pretty so it's, so it's pretty packed so it's like one after the other yeah yeah no it's um it's it's pretty intense there was at 
especially when um we have to drive the van with the bobsleigh sort of from destination to destination so it's kind of you've got to survive the drives as well as survive all the all the training and everything and I think I can speak on behalf of a lot of athletes traveling is is hard work on your body when you're kind of sat upright in a van for anywhere up to 13 hours um traveling across Europe mm. But it's but it's all fun, right? I mean, it's you know. It's, oh, it's, yeah, it's, it's great. It's all part of the the bobsleigh life, if you like. Exactly. It's, um, it's the, enjoyable, the and yeah, no, definitely. And it, all, all the um, the t- the team is great. Um, both is there. so there's two guys teams for GB, and then the one women's team, and the atmosphere is great. Um, everyone helps each other. It's just it's a really good atmosphere to be in, and it's something that I thrive off. I do very much like team. Mm-hmm. team atmosphere and, and team bonding and that kind of thing and that definitely helps when you're kind of trying to warm up in in minus 12 <laughs> in in the snow and stuff and you're <laughs> thinking how am I going to get warm it's it helps to have a good team around you and, and positive mindsets definitely mm. so you're obviously a very goal-driven person so what are your goals uh, moving forward with with uh, bobsleigh um, obviously, the, the ultimate goal is to to make the Beijing Olympics um, in 2022. Um, it's obviously was, um, I guess, t- taken away from me from me, if you like, when I crashed in 2016. Mm-hmm. Um, the girl, the girl who I actually crashed into, um, actually went on to win Olympic gold, which was um, oh, wow. which was quite hard to um, to take at the time, especially because my form. Mm-hmm. that year or well at that race I was coming round the corner to overtake her so my form I, I knew was good um but again everything happens for a reason or that I'm a big believer of that anyway so mm-hmm. um I'm just going to push on to Beijing and that is the the goal to to medal at the at the Winter Olympics so what's it, what does it take to reach um the Beijing Olympics is there a quali- uh, obviously there's a qualifying standard I mean do you have to finish in the top five, six of, of World Cup races, or, or how does that work? Um, I, th- I think it's the I think it's the top eight sleds. So basically, okay. qualification starts this season. Um, obviously, again, touch wood, providing that we have a season given um, given COVID. I think mm-hmm. there's a meeting with the IBSF in September, so we'll find out quite soon what the what the plan is. But um, yeah, that that's the the aim. Qualifying a sled should be should be easy we've kind of finished top five in the in some of the world cups and stuff this the season just been so so it's doable definitely exciting um question what gets you up in the morning especially um, when you don't feel motivated <laughs> um what gets me up um i guess the feeling of some something you know, there's always something to improve. That 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 feeling of you know, although I might not feel great today, that there's always something to improve on. You know, better in yourself, trying to perfect moves, and you know, in the gym, on the track, there's always room for improvement. And I think that's what gets me up in the morning. Um, obviously, as well, I just I love exercise. Again, I think if I, you know, when I do retire, I'll always. I'll always do exercise. It's just something that's a part of me. And I'm actually, I get told off from my, from my coach quite often for doing too much. I get told to rest more, <laughs> but um, I just love being active and love getting, getting up and getting up and about. So, mm. Okay. Um, so let me ask you this. Um, a young athlete comes to you for advice. Now they can be in any sport. So she might yeah. be, or he or she might be in gymnastics. They might be in, uh, cycling, whatever it may be, what advice would you give a young athlete of say twelve, thirteen that that wants to go on and be um, be a great athlete? Oh God, good question. Um, I, th- I guess that'd be the one thing that I would say. I mean, again, it's it, it might be a bit cliche, but it would be consistency. Be consistent. Um, that's something that has got me where I am today and I think is behind a lot of successful sports people it you know it's not about doing that you know those having that one good week of three sessions and then you know skipping one or then you know not being on it the following week it's turning up day in day out Mm -hmm. over a year and basically giving 
everything that you've got on that day. Um, so I think, you know, people's trajectories of performance are different. And I think, you know, it's really important to not compare yourself to others. Um, I mean, I, I learned that from from my injury. Um, you know, if I would have compared myself to others along my rehab journey, I think I would have just been, I would have completely lost my head and gone, you know, and gone, well, what's the point? I'm, I'm, I'm never going to get back. Um, so just focus on you and be consistent and, you know, the results will show. Yeah, that's great advice because everybody's on a different journey, right? Everybody yeah, progresses at a different time. And like you said, you can have illness, injury, all these things that come along, at that, which is part of the journey of obviously being a, being a top athlete as well. So, um, no, excellent advice. Um, any advice for parents out there? Because there's a lot of parents that listen to, mm -hmm. to, the, uh, to the podcast. Um, what advice would you have for sports parents? Because obviously you've been around a lot of sports. You've probably witnessed a lot of parents at sports events. What advice would you give parents right now who have um, a kid or, or kids in sport? Um, I guess, you know, be, be supportive as, you know, I'm, I'm sure, you know, all the sporting parents out there are. Um, I think, you know, at, at, especially in the early years, um, it, it's difficult for, you know, kids to get their he head around kind of you know the highs and lows the winning the losing the you know the injuries things like that so I think it's just about parents understanding um I guess you know the the vibes that they're getting off their child and just supporting them whatever you know whatever the outcome be it win or lose um also I think if there are times when you know, they don't want to go to training or they don't want to get up. Um, I don't think there's anything wrong with giving them, you know, a, a little bit of a nudge because, you know, although I say... Bucket, of, bucket of water? Bucket of water? <laughs> maybe, maybe not that much of a nudge, but, um, <laughs> but, you know, maybe just, you know, a quick word, you know, just to say, you know, you're, you're racing in four weeks. Come on, let's get this session done kind of thing. I guess that's the the equivalent of a coach almost so it's kind of I think a parent's job in the early years is to not only support you know your child as a parent but also I guess to be a little bit of a of a coach if that makes sense as well mm -hmm. yeah um so yeah just just support them as best as best you can awesome all right so let's move on to our final section it's uh quick fire questions one word or a sentence are you ready yeah, I'm not very good at these. I'm indecisive, so. <laughs> <laughs> All right, putting you on the spot. Uh, favorite food? Um, main meal would be Wagamama's and dessert would be cookies, definitely. <laughs> Any particular cookie? Um, oh, chocolate. The more chocolate, the better. Triple chocolate, <laughs> quadruple chocolate. <laughs> what, what, is, what is your reward meal or or treat after a good race what is your go-to i mean i remember i you know i competed in world championships in in duathlon i did uh, five world championships and i know this sounds very um plain but there was nothing more i wanted than a coke a coca-cola oh, no, I, I was gonna say I, honestly a diet coke after you've had a yeah. like a race it, it just yeah they <laughs> Yeah. It's really good. I, I remember. I would, I would agree. Yeah. I, I would. I would be in the middle of you know a race, European Championships, a race, World Championships. I would be in the middle of a race thinking about, I can't wait to get to the finish line to actually uh, the sound of that Coke. You know, opening it oh. like that. I mean, it's just bizarre what you think of when you're actually in the middle of a race or something. Obviously, your races are a lot more ex quicker and you don't have time maybe, but. You know, our races were, you know, say two hours, two and a half hours. You had a lot of time to think about what you were going to eat afterwards. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Um, no, I, I, I'd actually, I think there's something about a, a Diet Coke or a Coke, the way that <laughs> that hits after sport. It's, it, right? it is nice. Okay, so I'm, <laughs> I'm not the only one then. I mean, <laughs> no, definitely not. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Okay, good. Um, <laughs> all right. Uh, favorite city that you've visited? Oh, that I've visited. Um, I did really like um oh, where was it that we went um in Colum it was um oh my god where was it oh what's the uh, Carly in um Colombia it was it was very different mm. but god it was it was just very eye opening and it was it was a really good experience it was just a velodrome um 
I guess dumped in the middle of of nowhere but the the scenery and everything that we got to see when we went there was in was incredible and I'd I'd definitely like to go back and travel there definitely oh. or maybe Bar- Bali was stunning as well I, I went there for a couple of weeks I'd love to go back and you know properly have a look about there that's that was really nice so I mean I've, I've heard a lot about Colombia I'd love to go to Colombia obviously um Cali is is um not at altitude is it I know Bogota is is a very high altitude um I think Cali is a little bit because I think we flew into Bogota and then got another flight over to Cali I think the the velodrome is a little bit um at altitude but not Mm. not massively Mm. all right uh favorite hobby um (laughs) this is bad but it's can cleaning be considered a hobby? <laughs> Absolutely, and it's exercise too. <laughs> On it, I'm terrible. I just, I, I do. I have got not. I wouldn't say I'm kind of OCD, but I, I do like everything to be clean. So there, there's nothing better than doing like a proper deep clean. So v- Vicky, I think it's a bad habit. But <laughs> Vicky, here's the news. I think you are OCD. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> so clean, yeah, cleaning. Yeah. I would say. <laughs> would you describe yourself as a perfectionist? Oh, definitely, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. That's you know, that's, that's definitely one of the commonalities I've picked up with with a lot of world class athletes is that they are perfectionists or they're near perfectionists, and I think you do have to have that in you because it's definitely, that, yeah. yeah, it's that it's just striving to be better every day. It's just like that is not good enough. I need to be better. That is not good enough. I need to be better. You know, it's yeah, just yeah, that constant, yeah. Um, you know, constant pushing. Uh, favorite music or band or singer, either one. Um, R and B, definitely. Mm. I, I am a partial to con- a bit of country music. Actually, okay. I do like um some country, but I'd say predominantly, yeah, R and B vibes. Okay. <laughs> uh, favorite movie. Um, quite a recent one actually. It's called Gone Girl. I don't know if you've seen uh, it. I've heard of it. Heard of it. Um, it's just I remember the first time I watched it. It was just it's got such a big twist in it that you just don't see coming. And every time I watch it, I'm like, ah, yes. <laughs> uh, favorite actor and actress. Oh, um, actor. Um, I, I do really like Mark Wahlberg. I think he's really good. Mm-hmm. Um, female actress. Who would I say? Oh God, you know, I can't decide. There's so many. I'm trying to think of all the films that I, like there's there's oh no there's two I can't pinpoint one there's too many (laughs) Mm. you know Mark Wahlberg is um you're you're too young to remember this but growing up as a teenager I um there was a group called New Kids on the Block have you ever heard of that yeah no I have yeah they were one of the first boy bands before obviously NSYNC and um Backstreet Boys and so on and so forth but wow was he in that I think, well, his brother was Donnie Wahlberg. So Donnie, Donnie Wahlberg, uh, obviously the, the brother of Mark, he was the first one who was actually famous in the family. And then I think Mark came along later. Um, but yeah. look it up. They've actually got some. Yeah, yeah, well. <laughs> it's actually some really, really cool music. But the Wahlbergs are, are you know, um, they now obviously own that that hamburger chain here in America. Yeah, as I was well. going to say. Yeah, they 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 just re- opened a few of those in the UK. I think there's one in London, in Covent Garden. Yeah, there we I'm go. I'm yet to go. <laughs> I mean, it's a pretty cool name, right? The Wahlbergers. Yeah, it is. It is. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, favorite book or book you're reading right now? Any, anyone? Um, is is one of the um? Well, it's called the subtle art of not giving a. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's, it's basically what it is. Gotcha. Um, I just think it's just really good, and I think you know it's easy to pick up, and you don't have to kind of read it from the start. You can delve in halfway through, or you know, if you're just having a bad day or something, it's just good to have a have a flick through i think it's a really good read so anyone who's not read it i'd definitely uh, definitely get your hands on it mark mark manson right yes that's it yeah yeah that's the one yeah yeah Hmm. um all right uh favorite male athlete past or present um i would say um difficult again um Chris Hoy is definitely one of the. It It, it has to be. I was going to say it just before. 
I mean, <laughs> honestly, he's just, I, I cannot, you know, obviously I did, you know, I've, I, I'm maybe biased because I am, you know, d- did do track cycling sure. for, for nine years, but honestly, he is the nicest person on and off the track. Um, seems it. You know, he, he, he really is genuine. And I think that's what I love about him. You know, he's a hard worker. He's an animal on the track, but the second he steps off the track, he's, he's, he's just a nice person. And I think, I, I, you know, I swear by by that even today, you know, I, I don't think, you know, you don't have to be aggressive and competitive kind of all the time. You know, you, you can be a nice person <laughs> as yeah, well. You know, you yeah. don't have to be, you know, I don't know, you know, not I don't know if nasty is the word, but no, I yeah, I just yep. having trained with him for so long you can see why the public love him as, as much as they do because he's just so he's just so nice and he's pretty good at riding a bike as well yeah i'd say i mean i actually listened to an interview of him like two weeks ago so funny you should bring that up but um you know i'm writing my my next book and, and one of the things i wrote about was there's nothing more attractive um than somebody who's made it or who's been let's call it famous or or whatever and they're just a good per- they're just a really nice oh, it's person just, as well. yeah it honestly is, honestly it's, it's it's so nice it takes it, it to another level right i mean I, I, yeah. I have i haven't met david beckham i haven't met chris hoy but they you know just i mean okay let's go beckham level he he can't or roger federer i've met roger federer but they can't go anywhere without being recognized but they're just always ni- nice to people nice. have time for yeah, people yeah. Um, you yeah. know, I, you know, I've been in Dubai and I've been certain places on obviously the tennis tour and, and Roger Federer has been, been there as well. And I've never seen him once not turn down a photo or smile or speak to people. It's, and, and yeah. I mean, that's just, that is just so admirable. I mean, I just, it's amazing. It is definitely. No, I, th- I think that's the, you know, you, you get, you get winners in sports and you get champions and stuff, but I do think that is of the of the true true champions i do think at heart you know most of them major- well again i've not i've not met half of them but i think the majority would be like that mm. or i'd like to think they would be anyway i think it's a nice trait to have so. yeah absolutely um female athlete past or present um just re- recently retired actually lindsay vaughn um okay. the downhill skier um yep. i just think obviously most successful um female winter olympian is that right i think yep. she, uh, god knows how many golden globes and stuff she's um she's won um she's had injury after injury and yep. just gets up and goes again um and obviously fellow underarm athlete as well so <laughs> there you go push a little punt there <laughs> <laughs> um favorite sports team um oh the all blacks they're just great they're they're fabulous and i think they mm. just their whole ethos and everything about them is just is just brilliant okay um podcast any recommendations of a good podcast out there um be champion mind <laughs> very good i like that <laughs> um uh what podcast to be fair i'm guilty of just i guess going on spotify and, and looking on what's ever trending i'm kind of Mm-hmm. We'll listen to a bit of everything. Um, TED Talks has got a few good ones, though. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, just I, I'm very easy with what I listen to. Well, it's it's mainly finding the time, to be honest. <laughs> yeah. Um, lunch with uh, any two people. Who would they be? Oh, my gosh. Um, who would they be? Oh, that's really hard. Um, or one. One or two. Uh, Barack Obama, definitely. Okay, mm-hmm. that's a good one. Um, yeah, definitely. Mm, that, I like that. That's a good one. All right, uh, final question, or actually, um, uh, final question in this section. If you could describe yourself in three words, what would they be? Um, I would say determined, um, empathetic, and bubbly. Mm, I like that. I would say. Excellent. Um, before we get to our final question, if anybody wants to follow you, reach out to you, what are the best um, social media platforms? Um, my, I think well, I've got the same handle on everything, actually. Instagram, Twitter, and um, it's at Vix Williamson. So um, 
and my Facebook page is the same, I think, but Twitter or Instagram so at, would be great, please. At Vix William, Williamson, so V-I-C-K-S Williamson. Uh, V-I-C-S Williamson, oh, okay. Vix Williamson. V-I-C, okay, perfect. My uh, bio is um, I push... I used to push pedals, but now I push sleds. <laughs> so you'll know when you come across me. <laughs> uh, final question, and this has been a really, really fun chat with you. So thanks so much for taking the time out of your, no, your schedule. You. And, your, and your, your craziness at the moment with moving house and, and everything else <laughs> that's going on. So uh, it, finally, in your opinion, what does it take to be champion-minded? Um, again, there's, there's obviously lots that you know make uh, make up a champion but I'd say I guess a few things the first one would be you know you've got to be a hard worker or have like a high high work work ethic um talent will get you get you so far um and I think I I guess I've learned that the the hard way um obviously I was you know before I crashed I think I was more reliant on talent whereas now through my injuries, I've, I've ne- learned a new meaning to the phase, hard work. <laughs> mm. um, you know, I always aim to be um, first one in, last one out. Um, I think that's quite a good Love it. Um, th- thing to live by. Um, second thing I would say would be gratitude. Um, you know, be thankful for the help you receive from those around you. I guess the facilities you have access to, your sponsors, your friends, your family and support network. You know, they, they don't have to be there. They don't have to help you. Um, and I think if you are, if you do have, I guess, a sense of gratitude, it helps you deal with adversity um, mm-hmm. by making you just feel positive emotions because, you know, you're not, I guess, owed anything, if you like. Um, and the third one I would say would be motivation. Um, obviously, I, I think you you can't force the desire to want to train and to want to better yourself I think you you've got to have that from within and I think that comes from when you're really enjoying what you're doing Mm. don't get me wrong again there's sessions that I hate and there's there's times and I'm like oh god I really don't want to do this but the difference is I do it and then I feel better after I've done it because you know that's that's another session in the bag where I'm improving it or I guess improving one of my weaknesses so Definitely the motivations to, to succeed has got to be there as well. So I, I could go on and on. There's, there's countless traits. <laughs> <laughs> no, I love it. Perfect. Work ethic, gratitude, and motivation, the, um, the self-drive as well. Vicky, it's been a pleasure chatting to you. Um, you're an inspiration. Obviously, your journey yeah, is, thank you. <laughs> is not finished yet. So we're going to be following you definitely. I, <laughs> I'm definitely going to be following your progress as well. Much success with um, the training. Much success with um, uh, the qualifying for Beijing in 2022. And um, yeah, thanks so much for coming on. Thank you. No, thanks for having me. Thank you very much. So there you have it, guys. I hope you enjoyed that one with Vicky Williamson. Remember, this podcast is available on iTunes, YouTube, and on alistairmccaw.com. Connect with me on social media on Twitter, at Alistair McCaw, on Facebook, Alistair McCaw page, and on Instagram, Be Champion Minded. All books available on Amazon. So remember, you were made for greatness. Now go do the work. Stay champion-minded. <laughs>